What if Padme Amidala killed Newt Gunray on Naboo? In the original timeline, Newt Gunray and Rune Hako were both arrested by the Republic following their actions on Naboo, and they proceeded to instigate many of the events that kicked off the Clone Wars. On one of our old videos, though, one of our viewers wondered what if instead Padme had killed Newt Gunray on Naboo. That's the question that we'll be exploring today. So find a cozy fireplace, grab a cup of warm Sposhka and blue milk, and let's get right into this wild ride. Our story begins in the throne room of Naboo, following Padme's recapture of the Theed Palace. Anakin has just blown up the droid control ship, and the Viceroy of the Trade Federation is left completely unprotected. Padme tells Gunray that he's lost, and that his occupation is over. Newt Gunray in this scenario grows prideful though. He refuses to surrender and starts to run towards the Naboo guards. In a frenzy, Gunray miraculously manages to barrel through the guard contingent, making it to the hallway. Rune Hako calls out to him, telling Gunray to slow down and to just give up. However, it's too late for the Viceroy. <coughs> Padme fires a shot at Gunray and he crumples to the floor in a heap with a blast in the back of his head. Hako throws his hands up, understanding that if he even considered resisting, he would end up having the same fate as his dead colleague. Captain Panaka puts handcuffs on Hako, and the Naboo guards drag Newt Gunray's body from the palace hallways into a corner somewhere. Padme looks stern in the moment, not even appearing to question her decision. She needed to put on a face for her people, one of confidence. However, she feels a pang of guilt for killing another sentient being. How does this change the impact of the rest of our Star Wars timeline? Let's keep going and find out. Following the death of Gunray, the Trade Federation is thrown into disarray. Losing a key corporate leader causes their stocks to plummet, as investors lose confidence in the Federation's ability to manage their own affairs. When further details of the blockade become public knowledge, even fewer people are confident in the Trade Federation, and the Nymoidian economy begins to turn into shambles. A significant portion of their economic might revolved around the Trade Federation's success, and now that the mega corporation had taken a significant hit, their people started to suffer. Lot Dodd, the senator for the Trade Federation in the Senate, requests that the government fund a bailout for his people and for the Trade Federation as a whole. Many of the senators, who are frustrated that the Nymoidians had caused so many issues for them, vote against this motion, which Palpatine doesn't support either. As the new chancellor, he had promised to purge the Republic of corruption and needless bureaucracy, something that he needed to keep the appearance of doing to his people in order to maintain support. Padme, not wishing to see the Maimoidian people suffer due to the actions of one corrupt man, puts forward a middle ground legislation in the Senate. She proposes that if the Trade Federation can create a plan for new corporate leadership, regulations for their workers, and a demilitarization of their company, then the Republic could bail them out. She places a month-long timeline on her proposition, and many of the Senators are in favor of this motion. So the Republic votes to see it through, and they allow the Trade Federation time to restructure their company. The Trade Federation actually acts upon this, not seeing any other choice. Within a month, their entire board of directors is replaced, as is the Viceroy. They've laid out a plan for better treatment of their workers, including pensions. Beyond that, they've also committed to shutting down the battle droids, and they make an agreement that they will rely on regional defense forces or hired guns for protection in the future. The Senate grants aid to the Trade Federation, and the galactic economy begins to stabilize once again. Palpatine, having navigated this perfectly, comes out being seen as a hero for many by saving the Nymodians, along with forcing them to change their labor practices. Padme is recognized as well, but not nearly as much as the Chancellor, who brokered the deal in the Senate. Because of this perception of Palpatine as a compromiser, Dooku's ideas surrounding separatism are less popular than they are in the main timeline. The large corporations, knowing that the Republic will give them bailouts if needed, do not sign Dooku's treaty in Attack of the Clones, and the demilitarization of megacorporations has become more commonplace in the Republic. The Trade Federation had been received by the population with much more support when they were forced to work with local governments rather than simply taking over regional economies through force, and their profits were actually improving. Seeing this trend, companies that were seen on the corporate council in Attack of the Clones voluntarily decreased their military forces, and they don't want to get into a war as the profits are at an all-time high due to their actual cooperation with these various republic systems. 
While the weapons companies would profit from a war, because there isn't a military-industrial complex within the Republic, they know that they have a better opportunity to sell local defense forces stuff rather than Dooku, who is taking a large gamble with his proposed treaty of the Confederacy. In reality, while Dooku causes some issues for the Senate, his message is not well received, and Palpatine lets him continue to do his thing on Sereno. One of the big changes in this timeline is that Padme never has an attempt on her life. The changing corporate landscape in the galaxy would have frowned upon this, and Newt Gunray is dead. There's no one around who has a personal vendetta against the Naboo Senator, who is widely popular within the galaxy. Anakin and Obi-Wan are never assigned to protect her, and Anakin never ends up going on his weird teenage first love arc. Instead, he continues to mature with Obi-Wan as his master. While he's snippy and short-tempered, he never ends up falling for Padme, and Palpatine doesn't have much leverage with Anakin in terms of corrupting him. However, Palpatine still manages to weasel his way into the mind of the young apprentice, whispering in his ear about his mother. While Anakin doesn't go to Tatooine in this timeline, he is bothered, and Palpatine continues to egg on these emotions of uncertainty. One day, a prison break takes place at the Coruscant facility in which Rune Hako is being kept. Cad Bane, Boba Fett, Ara Singh, Bosk, and a couple of other bounty hunters end up freeing the former second-in-command to Newt Gunray. The Republic is unable to outwit these hunters, even as the Jedi come to help defuse the situation. Bane and his group escape with Rune Hako, who asks who on earth had actually bailed him out. Well, I guess not on Earth, because this is in the Star Wars galaxy. Let's say who on Coruscant bailed him out. There we go, that's better. Or, because he's Nymoidian, maybe it would even work to say who on Nymoidia had bailed him out. Yeah, that's what he says. Who on Cato Nymoidia had bailed him out. As it turns out, this group of bounty hunters had been employed by a new organization that needed Hako to be a face for their movement. When the group arrives on Nalhada, Hako is confused, wondering who would possibly want to meet him on this scug hole of a planet. There, when he arrives at the place where the Hut Council resides, a group of criminals from all of the major syndicates lays waiting for Rune. Furthermore, Maul and Savage, these two towering Dathomirians, also stand tall with malicious grins on their faces, and Mandalorian servants standing beside them. Maul tells Hako that they need him to be the face of a political movement. He could see that his former master was going unchallenged, and Maul wanted to provide a counter to his influence. Even Dooku, a man whom Maul had once thought to be a large piece of his master's puzzle, was doing absolutely nothing. Maul had to act now, and he had to use Hako as his mouthpiece. Rune's role in Maul's plan was to lead a new political movement, one that would not be of separatism or republicanism. Instead, Rune would be the prime minister of a new coalition of planets that opposed Palpatine's government, especially since it had imprisoned Rune for simply being coerced by Gunray. Behind the scenes, Maul's group would be gathering strength, and they would launch a full assault on the Republic when it was time. Rune is initially skeptical, but he's convinced when Savage places his saber to Hako's throat asking if he is grateful for being freed. The Nymoidian agrees to whatever their conditions are, hoping that these maniacs would spare his life once again. Soon, Rune becomes an extremely public figure. He's back in the news, and people see him all over the holonet. His views are broadcast to the galaxy, and it is clear that he's displaying them from Nal Hutta. Believing that this is simply a minor insurrection, the Jedi volunteer to go help with the eradication and apprehension of this former businessman, and of course, Palpatine accepts. In this timeline, the clones are never fabricated by sifo Dyas, because events transpire differently on Naboo, and Palpatine has to adapt his plan. Once again, he doesn't use Dooku as much as he did in the original timeline. Separatism never really takes off, and the Clone Wars morph into the conflict that is to come with the Shadow Collective. So, the clones do not go to deal with Nalhada, because the clones do not exist. The Jedi are still seen as peacekeepers, and the galaxy respects them, believing them to be moral, perfect, and people who can balance situations when push comes to shove. That is why they go and try and deal with the situation on Nalhada. While Palpatine isn't fully aware of what exactly is going on, he's heard whispers of Maul and Savage having returned to the galaxy. He keeps his ear out, as a Sith Lord does. 
He knows that the Jedi have too, but in their arrogance, they're hearing none of it. They still think that they're the dominant force users in the galaxy, and they can't even fathom that there could be others out there trying to usurp them. The Jedi, along with Yularen, who has become a prominent figure within Republic security forces, and a small contingent of the Coruscant Defense Force, end up deciding to take a few cruisers to try and extinguish this threat on Nalhada, believing that it will be a swift death to ruin Hako's little return. Sadly, they're quite mistaken. When they arrive at Nalhada, the Jedi are taken in for a massive surprise. Maul, having seen the Jedi's arrogance, had planned with his brother for this situation. When the contingent of Jedi arrive on Nalhada, they are almost immediately met with a huge force of criminals. Huts, Pikes, Black Sun, Death Watch, and Crimson Dawn are all represented, and they're hungry for blood. This takes the entire Republic delegation off guard, because for some reason, Republic intelligence hadn't managed to capture that there was this corporate alliance of criminal syndicates going on. For some reason, perhaps corruption within the ranks of the Republic intelligence or within the Senate itself, nobody seemed to be aware of how deep this criminal problem went. The criminals don't even wait for the Jedi to begin their assault. It's too late for them as soon as this attack begins. Because their attack force is so small, they're unable to counter the destructive power of Maul's criminal empire. Anakin, Obi-Wan, Mace Windu, and Yoda end up being able to escape in their Jedi starfighters, which they had used with the hyperspace rings to get to Nalhada, separate from the Republic Venators. And they watch in horror as many of their Jedi comrades are slain by the hordes of criminal attack vessels. Anakin tries to get Yularen on the line, but his ship's communications are jammed. Anakin slams his hand on the dashboard in frustration, growling in anger. Many of his friends had just died, and it seemed like the three masters who had escaped with him don't even care. Anakin could sense their sorrow, but each of them recite platitudes about how now their friends are just one with the Force and they had to move on with their lives, and be joyous that their friends had died. They manage to link up with their hyperspace rings and get out of the system, going back to Coruscant. Anakin is devastated, and he feels an incredible lack of support from the people who were supposed to be his closest confidants. Instead of being there for Anakin in his grief, they chastise him for feeling, well, anything. Anakin shakes his head in frustration, turning off his communicator and simply crying in his piloting bubble for only him and R2 to hear. When the four Jedi arrive on Coruscant, they're met with jeers from many citizens. Apparently, the criminals under the leadership of Rune Hako had launched attacks on many other Republic worlds after the defeat of the Jedi, causing suffering for many citizens. The Huts took plenty of them into slavery, and the other organizations had essentially taken over operations on many Outer Rim worlds. They'd set up their own little despotic mini-empires under the supervision of Rune Hako as Prime Minister of this illegitimate coalition of criminal worlds. Mandalore as well, under the leadership of Prime Minister Almec decides to join this coalition and decry the Republic leadership for how they had treated Mandalorians for years. He begins to militarize his people again, and they join the fight in public now for everyone to see. Bree Vizsla had clearly had an influence on the population, and the Mandalorians are a very difficult force to deal with when paired with these criminals and with Maul and Savage. Maul and Savage are rolling in resources, laughing at their success. Hako continues to spew rhetoric against the Republic and against the Chancellorship. Even Mandalore, once again a world renowned for its neutrality, has Prime Minister Almec decrying the Republic for their response to this crisis and again joining in on the fight. Palpatine also turns on the Jedi publicly, stating that this mishandling of a security crisis was proof that they were no longer suitable to handle the peacekeeping missions of the Republic. Instead, he says that it's time to create a standing military, an action that is cheered on by most senators. Padme continues to advocate for a peaceful de-escalation of tensions, especially since she's still struggling with the fact that she had shot Newt Gunray all of those years ago. Sadly, her voice is lost in the swaths of cheers for Palpatine. She knows that war can cause suffering on so many people, and it bothers her that these senators, who would mostly come from wealthy worlds and wealthy families, didn't seem to get that. 
The Republic still begins to mobilize, though, and Palpatine uses this situation to bring Anakin further from the Jedi. He tells the young man that they misunderstood him, tried to force him to conform to their narrative. Palpatine offers Anakin a solution to his problems, a military position in his government that could help crush these criminals rather than continuing his path with the dying order of Jedi. Anakin could express his emotions, and he could be heralded as a hero of the Republic. Beyond this, Palpatine promises that if he joins him, they will do everything in their power to find out what happened to Anakin's mother, something that the Jedi had never even considered doing to give Anakin closure. In a moment of weakness, Anakin agrees, finding this proposition incredibly appealing. Anakin leaves the Order after this instance, joining Palpatine and becoming a prominent military commander in the battles with Rune Hako's Shadow Collective. How do these events impact the end of our story? Let's find out. At the end of the day, as soon as willing recruits begin pouring into the Republic's military, the criminals are unable to continue their full-on assaults of Republic space. They have lots of resources, sure, but not as many as Palpatine does. He cracks down on Maul and Savage's expansion, and eventually, Anakin ends up slaughtering both of them in battle with his ferocious force prowess. Under the influence of Palpatine, he's learned to tap into his darker emotions, gradually slipping deeper and deeper into the dark side. He's respected by his troops, and the galaxy does, indeed, consider Anakin to be a hero for his actions in the galactic conflict. Still, though, Anakin doesn't know about Palpatine's secret Sith allegiances. Following this conflict, the Jedi are ridiculed. People demand that they leave Coruscant due to their disgusting lack of foresight that had led to a destructive conflict breaking out across the galaxy. Even Anakin demands that they leave, frustrated with how they had treated him and allowed for so many civilians to die. The remaining Jedi go into exile, and Palpatine promises that if any of them ever return, they will be punished for their arrogance. Anakin is slightly saddened by the departure of Obi-Wan, but he doesn't care that the others are leaving. After their utter disregard for his feelings in favor of their dogma, Anakin could care less about any of them. Palpatine, knowing that he now had a firm chance to maintain peace in the galaxy, calls for the reform of the Republic into the Empire. With Anakin by his side, he declares himself leader of the galaxy to the Senate, which is widely cheered on. Padme, Bale, and Mon Mothma, however, do not share the sentiments of their fellow politicians. As the Empire continues to consolidate more and more power, they work in the shadows, trying to get in contact with the remaining disgraced Jedi in order to build a powerful rebellion. The Empire reaches far and wide. Rune Hako is captured and executed for treason this time. Palpatine's populism is cheered on, and Anakin enforces Palpatine's will with an iron fist. While at this moment he is more of a grey Jedi than he is a Sith, he continues to dive deeper and deeper into those dark side feelings as it intoxicates him, and for the first time he truly feels alive. The Sith, despite not having made it known widely to the galaxy, have finally managed to take control. Only time would tell if they are able to hold on to that newfound power. However, Things were not looking good for the citizens of Palpatine's galaxy. Hello folks, I hope that you enjoyed today's What If scenario. If you did, I'd recommend that you look at this other video, What If Kanye West Was Trained as a Jedi? If you have any thoughts on our narrative, please drop them in the comments. Would you like to see a part 2? What do you think would happen next? Have an awesome rest of your day, fellow Star Wars fans. And, as always, I hope that you've had your delicious daily dose of Bantha Stew.